right, so today has been a long time coming. I have wanted to make a repo for BMS for so long, something that allows me to do version control, basically a system that allows you to revert versions or to fork versions. So let's say I have the most latest version of BMS and I do something horribly wrong, I mess up something, something that I don't even remember, or maybe I'm working on something and then six months later, I figure out I made a colossal mistake. Well now, what I can do is simply go back into my network and with a few clicks, I'll be able to get back to a previous version and continue my work. And hopefully that process will be as quick as possible. This is a pretty simple thing to do with small projects that um, are maybe a few kilobytes, maybe a few megabytes in size, but when it comes to doing stuff with assets, which is what BMS does, places like GitHub, they just don't support sizes like 250 gigabytes, 300, a terabyte, which is what BMS might come out to be one day. So I've decided now to invest in a NAS. If you don't know what that is, that's network attached storage and basically have that storage over my network. Unfortunately, one of the downsides of building on BMS is that I'm using other people's assets. So that means I can't redistribute them. All right, so first off, what we have is the Terramaster F5422. This thing is a beast. It has it's, it's quite pretty old now, it still runs pretty old hardware, but for network attached storage it doesn't have to be the greatest, so I don't care. The main feature that this thing has is 10 gigabit ethernet, so it allows me to locally uh, basically access these files on this NAS at theoretically the maximum of 10 gigabits, which is about 1 gigabyte per second transfer speed. That's actually faster than SATA SSDs, for example. So anyway, let's crack this thing open. It's pretty simple, it's a little box. There's really not much to it. It's basically like a mini computer inside of a metal chassis with a few fans in the back. It's not even like really great hardware. It's just that the 10 gigabit was a real selling point for me. I want transfer speeds to be fast, especially when I'm dealing with 250, 500 gigabytes of data and I need to revert versions. It needs to be quick. At the same time, this thing was really not that expensive when it comes to network attached storage. Like the 10 gigabit stuff for network attached storage usually comes in around about $1,000 just for the enclosure. That's without the hard drives. So this thing was a pretty good deal at only around 500, 600 bucks. I think with the shortages and everything, it's gone up a little bit, but still um, not bad. So let's crack this thing open. All right, should be pretty quick. There we go. This thing is designed for 24 hour operation. So that means it'll basically always be running. Pretty simple to use. At least I think it's pretty simple to use. You can pull out the hard drive base this way. There's one, two, three, four, yep, and five slots. Pretty simple. I have these beauties right here. This is my old one that I had lying around, and I've also bought four more of them. Now you might be thinking, Elias, how the heck are you gonna get 10 gigabit transfer speeds? That's one gigabyte per second, just about. How are you going to get 10 gigabit speeds off a hard drive, which is like literally 170 megabytes per second tops. Well, this is where a network attached storage solution like this comes into play. The cool thing is, is that you can set these things up. This one runs uh, Terra OS, which is like a custom version of Linux. And on those, you can set up things like RAID. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do here. Now with RAID, the cool thing is, is that your speed actually increases the more drives you have. So what it actually does is it stores the data across all the drives instead of a singular one. And that means that the data can be pulled through all the drives at once. Um, simultaneously. So it's like having multiple lanes for data instead of one single one that you're typically used to on a hard drive. So with five, we should get, these are about 200 megabits per second, maybe a little less, uh, 175, 180, not megabits, megabytes, excuse me. So combining these together, we should get about one gigabit, if I'm not mistaken. It might be a little less in the real world, but theoretically that's what we should be getting out of this. So that's what I'm really hoping for.
Ooh, all right, so if you're wondering why my haircut's different and why we fast forwarded in time, well, there have been quite a few issues. Well, let's reverse time a little back. This one runs uh, Terra OS. Terra OS. Terra OS. Remember that? Yeah, turns out that is a big problem. On top of that, I also had a hard disk die on me, so I had to order a new one, which in and of itself wasn't a real problem, but the whole Terra OS business, that did stop me. So, le let me explain to you what the issue is. Hey Elias, thanks for totally taking the time to explain that a week ago. Uh, let's go to the whiteboard now so I can actually show you. Whoa, that is really big. All right, hold on. <laughs> Uh, okay, okay, now let's actually pretend. Let's pretend that you're some crazy-haired guy on the internet with a really long beard, and you, like, I don't know, let's say have to manage your um, Skyrim mod list, right? Well, there are two types of files. There's only two types of files ever in existence on a computer. Don't quote me on that unless you're an expert, please. All right, so there's text files, right? And then you have the other one. You have binary files. Now, what you might think is that, you know, to version control these, you should probably use the standard industry thing, which is, I don't know, Git? Use that to manage both of these? Well, actually, there's a problem. You see, Git only works well with one of these types of files. Yeah, uh, Git completely sucks at managing binary files. Unfortunately, binary is what BMS mostly is. It mostly has assets, okay? So, Git has a few problems with it. Number one, uh, it makes incredibly large uh, data sets that become kind of unmanageable and they get uh, extra data in them that doesn't get removed properly. And the size of the repository just grows and grows exponentially if you say have I don't know, 250 gigabytes of, uh, of 3D models or something like that. So Git is uh, not, not really a thing. You might think, well, why don't you just use Git LFS, which stands for Large File Server. There's a few problems with that. L let me just show you. So let's say this is your, I don't know, your basic folder that you're that you're managing with git lfs, right? Well, if you have like say a text file something .txt, right? Uh, 2.txt, right? They're they're all there. But what git lfs does is if it finds that you have a binary, what it instead does is it makes a pointer to it. If you put a binary file on a git lfs run server, you have to store it externally you have to put it in a different spot so you might have your 3d model elsewhere and that is also kind of problematic because you don't want to manage two different things that also seems like a pain in the ass it's not ideal you see what i mean well uh it turns out that there's a few people in the industry that actually have thought about this a little bit um by the way i in no way endorse this company they just really happen to be doing something that really fits what i'm doing so i uh, I guess they're cool. Um, it's called Perforce. Now these guys have absolutely made it their mission to go out there and, I don't know, like reel in every single possible customer they might have. I was on their website and I've, I've been spammed for days. So if, <laughs> I would be so unhappy if I didn't want to use their product right now. Joke's on them, because I don't actually have any money. <laughs> Did I spell Perforce with an S? Are you kidding me? If they're going to sponsor me in the future, I at least better spell it right, right? Anyway, <clears throat> Perforce with a C. They have absolutely made it their mission to go out and try to uh, compete with the current industry standard for programmers, at least, Git. Now, one thing that they do differently than Git is unlike Git LFS, they actually store all the binaries on their server. So binary is on their server. There's no pointer to it going elsewhere. They've also optimized their code in the back end. Is, I mean, at least that's what they tell me. I have no way of actually verifying this. Is very efficient at removing pointers to binary files that are no longer needed. And uh, as well as that, it also supports it supports the usual text files. And if you just really love Git and you just can't can't leave Git, 
Well, there's actually an extension for Perforce that lets you, uh, you know, basically use it like Git. In fact, I'm pretty sure it probably even uses all the same commands and everything. It's probably just like a shell for, <laughs> it's like a shell for Perforce that makes it feel more like Git. Which is actually kind of crazy because that's how bad they want people's business, apparently. So just like Git, it can store text files, but it can also handle binary data, which is kind of cool. So yeah, uh, Perforce, it's called Perforce Helix Core. That's what I'm going to be using. So that's all dandy, right? Pretty easy, just install Perforce on my Terra Master, TOS, NAS, and we'll be off to the races, right? No, 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 no. Unfortunately, Perforce is limited to Windows operating systems for deployment, as well as Linux Ubuntu and uh, Linux uh, Red Hat, I think uh, the alternative to that is CentOS, of course. So it's limited to CentOS, uh, Red Hat, uh, server-based Linux or whatever, and Ubuntu. So <laughs> what I've decided is that I'm going to install CentOS 8 on my TerraMaster NAS. Okay, so as you can see, I've cracked open the TerraMaster F5422, and it's pretty actually pretty simple on the inside. It's quite elegant. Uh, what we have here is just a regular old motherboard with 10 gigabit Ethernet on it, and uh, just a passive heatsink on a on our uh, processor here you would think that there would be like an onboard chip or something on this motherboard that would contain the operating system but uh no it's it's actually far less secure let me show you let's get a let's get a macro shot here so yeah this right here is just a small little internal usb uh usb female end with a mini <laughs> with a small form factor flash drive inside of it. And that is where the operating system lives, is on this little flash drive. So <laughs> you can see that everything here is standard, minus the operating system. So what we can easily do is just swap this out with another low factor uh, flash drive. This is uh, Gen 2 USB speeds, by the way, but for some reason this flash drive is 3.0. We can swap this out and then install another flash drive on the top and then boot uh, from the BIOS of the motherboard. And then we can just install our CentOS 8 on, on this little internal USB place. So yeah, it shouldn't be too hard as long as I figure out how Linux works. I've tried installing Arch Linux before, but I failed at it miserably, but CentOS looks to be a lot more friendly with its installation process than Arch does. So yeah, uh, I'll do that. <laughs> One week later. Oh, okay, so it's been about a week and a half or so later after the last clip, but I've finally done it. I've installed CentOS 8 after about, I don't know, retrying maybe, 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 maybe a dozen times. It was probably more. It's probably like 16 or so. I've reinstalled that operating system. I'm just unfamiliar with Linux to begin with, and... Uh, I'll, I'll give CentOS 8 credit. It was really easy to set up initially, but it gave me the option to install like packages and it didn't explain what those packages were. And so that gave me a little bit of hiccup. So I just got the basic installation and I did everything else from there myself. Anyway, CentOS 8 is pretty nifty and I like it now that I've figured out how to use it. But let me, let me just show you on the screen. So this is Cockpit. It's an application running on the TerraMaster toaster oven that I bought on the on the CentOS 8 server. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to log in remotely on your browser if you're on the same network and uh, basically manage it from there. So you can do all the cool stuff like, I don't know, manage your RAID arrays, for example, uh, view network traffic, ingoing and out, outgoing traffic, your firewalls and stuff. And the cool thing is that it even has its own its own little terminal thing. So, for me, the the really the thing here that was most challenging for me was using this command line terminal for everything. As somebody who's never really used Linux in his life, uh, figuring out all the commands to install the Perforce server on here. Actually, to be fair, Perforce was probably the easiest one. The SMB Windows file sharing application called Samba was little more challenging than that to get all the permissions set up and everything but anyway finally got it finally got it after another week spent in uh, a dev nightmare loop or something anyway uh, the point is everything's set up I can I can open up my perforce uh, 
server right here and I can make all my changes as you can see I got a BMS BMS zero if you're wondering it's just the base game that I'm starting to do so I can make development a little easier that will allow me to code up an application and basically merge all the BMS versions together uh, to just make things easier on my end it, it should hopefully alleviate some manual frustrations anyway yeah I've made a few commits to it or submitted a few changes whatever perforce wants to call it uh, to it and yeah it, it seems to run pretty well if I want I can turn this into like a stream and I can make forks and different versions and etc etc and whatnot uh, like I was saying I also got the SMB file share set up unfortunately it's not as fast as I wanted to so it's got a 10 gig connection and I verified that it's 10 gigs so yes it's definitely 10 gig but uh, as you can see let me transfer this file it's an old video I made like forever ago and it's eight gigabytes but anyway you can see I get speeds around like 550 500 megabytes per second which isn't the gigabyte per second that I was hoping to get I was hoping to get like maybe 800 megabytes 900 megabytes or so it ain't happening here and so I did a little digging and it turns out that it's with the little uh, SATA connector SATA controller I guess uh, that's plugged into my PCI Gen 2 slot that I think that allows for 600 megabytes per second transfer simultaneous which is a real shame because that's that's the bottleneck in my little toaster ovens so the gearheads that put it together obviously didn't think it all through which is kind of frustrating maybe I can find like an alternative PCI slot on AliExpress or something but I doubt it because it's a pretty slow lane so I think I'm probably stuck with 600 I think I'm stuck with that but that's okay because if I would have made like a regular like micro ITX motherboard PC NAS I think that would have capped out at about 250 megabytes per second so mini ITX motherboards they don't really support 10 gig um, onboard networking so you'd have to buy another card and that you would have to get a bigger case and blah 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 so I think it would have cost me more than this thing cost which yeah, totally happy with. Yeah, what else can I tell you guys? Uh, it's it's really great. I've been I've just been enjoying CentOS 8. It's been now that I figured it out and I figured out how to remove packages, add packages, and all that stuff. And packages are just like software, right? It's been fun, and I've been able to do other fun stuff like hosting my Foundry D and uh, D server on it, for example, uh, because that's pretty lightweight too. And it's yeah, it's it's no, it's it's really great. Figuring out some command line stuff, some Linux stuff. So it's, it's definitely been an adventure. I just really wish it hadn't taken this long so I could do other stuff. But now that it's up, I can finally start actually actively developing BMS again. And um, now that I have a version control system that actually lets me track changes and revert back, I, I should be progressing along a little bit faster at least. Anyway, if you guys enjoy my videos where I sit here in a bathrobe at 2 in the morning talking to you guys, uh, please leave a like. It really helps me out. If you guys want to support BMS, my Patreon link is in the description below. Uh, God, this took three weeks to make, and it's been, oh, it's been, it's had its ups and downs for sure, mostly ups, but it is still, it, it takes time out of my life, so I hope you guys appreciate it, and hope you guys like it as much as I do. Um, it's, it's almost April now, so that means that my next couple of videos will be about uh, my new uh, grass projects, which I'm really excited for. I can't wait to get started on that. I'm finally done with this thing. I finally have a version control system set up, and it just makes me so happy. But leave a like. Go check out the BMS Patreon if you want to support it. Like the video. I don't know. Leave me a comment telling me how stupid I was about my Linux installation and how it shouldn't have taken me 16 tries or something. But, um, yeah. Anyway, I... <laughs> so what happens when you don't know shit and you have to figure it out, I guess. Anyway, I'll catch you in the next video. 16 tries it take it took me. Can you believe that? I had to reinstall this thing so many times, so many, so many times mashing the delete key. I really need to find something better to do with my life. God, why do I have to love this?